Subconcussive and repetitive head impacts in sport. What do we know about it? The big concern is CTE, but should we really be concerned about that? We're gonna look at this systematic review of subconcussive head impacts in sport. It's from 2018, and it looked at the structural changes, the neuropsychological changes, and the head impact metrics uh, that are associated with repetitive head impacts and subconcussion. And I'm particularly concerned about this research because I was a, I'm a small former ice hockey player that played for 13 years, was hit a lot, performed hits a lot, was grindy in the corners. Um, so I'm really curious what we found. Uh, this study broke it into structural changes, neuropsychological changes, and head impact exposures, like I said. What did they find for the structural changes that occurred in the brain? Most of the studies included in here, so there was, they screened about 2,000 studies, included 56. In terms of the structural evidence, there was 21 studies there. Most of the studies suggested microstructural changes. So these structural changes included white matter changes, decreased brain volume, cortical thinning, and among these studies included, 93% of them were rated as moderate to strong evidence, meaning there's some concern uh, despite the, the controversy and the, the inconclusiveness and doubt around some of these imaging methods in concussion. The consistency and how strong the study was put together means there's some concern for athletes with repetitive head impacts. In terms of biomarkers, biomarkers are things you can find in the saliva, the blood. Um, I know there's new research coming out on like salivary mRNA. There's been a lot of research on SB100, neurofilament light. Within the concussion world, that evidence is really inconclusive, which makes it even trickier for the sub-concussion world. Um, SB100 results have been ambiguous. Neurofilament light uh, results have been pretty ambiguous. But what's kind of cool is uh, when we were looking at a subset of football players, so they mentioned this, a subset of football players, there was a nutritional intervention study and it had really strong methodology, meaning it was a pretty good study to look at. And what they found is that supplementing two grams of DHA, so the omega-3s are EPA and DHA, these football players that supplemented DHA found uh, decreases in neurofilament light at the end of the season. I think that was it, yeah, neuroprotective and decreases of neurofilament light at the end of the season, so that was pretty cool. When we look at females, so not necessarily a structural change, not necessarily a biomarker change, but when we look at blood flow, so it's kind of a biomarker, when we look at blood flow, one of the only studies that actually looked at female athletes looked at blood flow after a soccer season. And they found that blood flow regulation was disrupted for like four to five months after the season, but it did eventually resolve after about eight months. So we're not sure what to do there. So the general conclusion that these guys came up with, which um, is kind of concerning for me, was that prolonged exposure to repetitive head impacts is associated with structural and functional changes in male athletes. What makes me a little less concerned is that we don't know if that's good, bad, or ugly. We're not actually sure what, what that means. So I'll talk about that in a second because we're gonna to get to the neuropsych evidence. So the neuropsych evidence, this is your memory, your attention, your executive function. These are things that in concussion we test on the SCAT-5, uh, the impact, those are kind of the two big ones. This section included 17 studies looking at the neuropsych evidence and memory, attention, and executive function were the most commonly measured. But, and the good news for me is that there were only significant findings in about 10% of the assessments, meaning that around 90% of the assessments found no association with repetitive head impacts and memory, attention, executive function changes. So that's good. There might be some relationship between higher contact sports versus lower contact sports, but anyone could have assumed that. The most promising that we might find in terms of results are if we combine the neurobiological, so the structural and the biomarkers with the neuropsychological. Um, because there's such a variety of neuropsych tests that were used, within this review, they reviewed a whole bunch of studies and there was over 30 different neuropsych tests used. So we can't necessarily compare apples to apples when there's different tests used. So we can't make strong conclusions around the neuropsych tests anyway. So the three conclusions that these guys came up with, that these guys came up with, was the current neuropsych tests just aren't good enough. They're not sensitive enough to detect the subtlety of subconcussion. Maybe, the second conclusion was maybe subconcussion just doesn't cause neuropsychological changes. And the third conclusion, which I'm kind of apt to agree with, is that the brain can adapt and compensate through plasticity and cognitive reserve. Um, so the general conclusion with neuropsych is that the evidence doesn't actually support a relationship between subconcussion and cognitive deficits. So that's a win for me there. They also looked at head exposure, head impact exposure metrics. So this included 18 studies and it's kind of looking at how hard you have to get hit, where you have to get hit. 
And the general conclusion here was that it's really difficult to draw any conclusions, but some trends emerged. And so the trends that they found were that being hit in the front or the top of the head was associated with the highest linear acceleration. So they reached 80 Gs or higher most consistently getting hit in the front of the head or the top of the head. And we know that for a concussion to occur, you need a minimum of like 70 to 90, 90 Gs and up to like 120 to 160 Gs of, of linear acceleration. Um, so these areas from the top of the head appear to be the most vulnerable locations for impact and more frequent head impacts occurred during games than practices, which we could assume. So the two conclusions, front of the top of the head is associated with higher accelerations, um, more vulnerability, uh, more frequent impacts occurred during games versus practices. The big thing here, another conclusion and trend that they found is that there's lots of limitations in head impact exposure technology. So the accelerometers they put in helmets or mouth guards or to your skin. So improvements in this tech and in this research would help us out a ton in the concussion and subconcussion world because we could quantify how much do you actually need for a concussion? What would define a subconcussion? Um, so some limitations in the studies, uh, limitations in this subconcussive research, which again makes me feel a little bit better to know that there's limitations in this, is that 54% of the studies had really small sample sizes and they didn't resport, report response or attrition rates. So they didn't report how many people dropped out or why. Um, they didn't report some of these responses, which means there's a sampling bias. It means that the people that, uh, sampling bias is typically people who engage in studies that they think are relevant to them or that they think would help them. Or um, We see that in CTE. CTE research is very, very biased towards people that already have mood disorders, movement disorders, psych disorders. Um, and then lo and behold, we find CTE. So we don't actually, we can't make as strong of a conclusion. So there's a high risk of type one, so false positive uh, research errors because a lot of these studies also had inadequate or absent control groups. That's another um, way to decrease validity and to increase that bias, that sampling bias. If you don't have, uh, you know, subconcussive repetitive impact like ice hockey players compared to like an orchestra group or, you know, some sport in school that, or some organization in school that has no head impacts, we don't necessarily know if the changes are, are necessarily related to normal development or different than not getting hit in the head. Uh, quote from the study, youth and female athletes were severely underrepresented. This study included mostly male football players, so we don't necessarily know what's going on with youth athletes. We don't necessarily know what's going on with female athletes. Um, most studies also didn't screen for substance abuse, and we know that substance abuse, certain drug use is associated with white matter and structural changes that we're attributing to subconcussion. Uh, many measures were actually indirect, meaning some of these head impacts were self-reported and we know that from concussion research self-reporting is not very reliable and history of concussion was not accounted for so if we assume that actual concussion measurable diagnosed clinically diagnosed concussion causes changes um, and we didn't account for that in the sub-concussion world then how do we know that these aren't attributed to previous concussions so that's kind of the limitations one of the things that i thought was really important and I just wanted to read from here. So we're gonna talk about defining subconcussion. So I thought this was really interesting and important to define subconcussion. So I'm gonna read directly from the study here. Two critical questions arise from the vague use of the term and the associated implication for research and practice. One, is subconcussion an injury? Two, how do we describe or assess subconcussive impacts? This situates subconcussion on a spectrum between the absence of injury and concussion. So what we're saying basically is that subconcussion is somewhere between nothing and a concussion. The problem is that concussion is diagnosed by signs and symptoms and subconcussion is recognized by the absence of a concussion diagnosis. Defining subconcussion by what it's not doesn't tell us what it is. So subconcussion is really, really fuzzy. It remains unclear whether the functional and microstructural changes identified in our review are distinct from those seen with concussion. Our conclusion after reviewing the evidence available are consistent with the arguments put forth by Bellinger et al. who suggested the term head impact is more accurate than subconcussion and Sfaldi et al who suggested research should focus on the cumulative effects of mild repetitive head trauma experienced, and we too recommend that we should refrain from using the term subconcussion and subconcussive injury because they can't be defined. So, the overall conclusion 
This evidence presented identified that repetitive hits to the head in male athletes are associated with deleterious effects on the microstructural integrity and function of the brain. Whether these changes are temporary or permanent cannot be determined without further research. Insufficient evidence was presented to conclude that repetitive head impacts are associated with neurocognitive impairment. And in terms of head impact exposure, specific impact thresholds leading to injury could not be identified in male or female af athletes. So given the evidence, we conclude the following. One, exposure to repetitive head impacts, repetitive hits to the head in sports presents a risk of microstructural and functional changes to the brain in male athletes. Two, prolonged exposure to repetitive head impacts in sport for both male and female should be avoided. And further study is essential to advance our understanding of how exposure to head impacts affects the brains of athletes in the short and long term. So I hope that was helpful. Basically, subconcussion is a thing, maybe, uh, not necessarily associated with psycho neuropsychological outcomes, probably associated with structural changes, but we really need to differentiate that from concussion and we really need to compare it to the general population. Um, so that's kind of what we know about uh, sub-concussion. If you want to know more, this was from 2018. If you want to know more of the research that's happened since 2018, go ahead and check out the blog at the link in the description below. I covered this, I covered some of the blood flow changes, some of the other things that we know and some of the things we can do to prevent this, because sports aren't gonna stop, falls aren't gonna stop, car accidents aren't gonna stop, little bumps and bruises are always gonna happen. So what can we do to minimize this neuroinflammation, possibly minimize these structural changes, um, and what can we do for these high-risk athletes like hockey players, football players, lacrosse players, rugby players, etc. cetera. Um, so I hope you found this, this useful. If you did, give it a thumbs up, and uh, go ahead and follow my account for more concussion, post-concussion content.